Well, Patty, I'm really excited about our uh, podcast episode today. Uh, we start off with a great interview that I did with Ben uh, from over at Maverick Payments talking about high risk. Um, mm-hmm. It's become something that, frankly, a lot of ISOs are just saying, hey, we don't have, we just won't deal with it. Yeah. And Maverick has come up with a really unique approach. So I think that's going to be interesting uh, for our listeners. Um, and then tell us about the Insiders Report today. It's an interesting topic as well. Yeah, we have a clash of titans, Amazon versus uh, Visa. Uh, I'm sure some people have heard, seen some headlines. I yep. delve into that a little bit to give us, put it into context. And then I really enjoyed your question from the field today, James. Yeah, so we just uh, really today we just talk about um, just sales techniques, a little more of some advanced mm-hmm. sales topics and how to acknowledge the negative so that your customer doesn't, you know, leave your pitch feeling like what's the catch, but keeping the focus and the emphasis on the positive um, so that you can really accomplish, you know, getting the deal done um, and avoiding a lot of the let me think about it, leave your information uh, right. type objectives. Um, yeah. Of course, our episode today is brought to you by NMI.com. Uh, you can learn more about NMI. They're a fantastic gateway processor agnostic. They have great APIs. Uh, just a, a, we're really proud to have them as our sponsor. And you can go to ccsalespro.com slash NMI, ccsalespro.com slash NMI. Uh, to learn more about them. Uh, So Patty, I'm ready to go if you are. Let's do it. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Hey everybody, I'm here today with Ben Griefer. Ben is the company operating officer over at Maverick Payments. How are you doing today, Ben? Doing wonderful, how are you? Doing awesome, man, doing awesome. So uh, (laughs) I'm very excited today to talk about um, higher risk accounts and how Maverick has really gotten into this in in what I think is a very unique way. And I really like what you're doing here, Ben. So um, before we dive into that, I know you've been quite some time. Last time you were on the podcast was, I think, like pre-COVID or at least pre-like COVID changing everything, right? Yeah, it was uh, March of last year, I believe. Yeah. Which is crazy to think about how how much the time has just flown by. So you know, give us a little update on on uh, Maverick. How's everything going at Maverick Payments? Uh, you know, in your role, give us a little update on how things are going with you, and then we'll dive into the topic today. Yeah, everything has been um, excellent for us. We've continued to grow quite a bit. Um, you know, most of our our merchants come through uh, resellers and sales agents, so we've really focused on that that model, and it's been great. I mean, the growth has been amazing. We've seen a lot of changes, obviously, with COVID and card not present. Um, you know, and things like that. But overall, it's it's the last year, year and a half since last time we spoke has been wonderful. Yeah. And, and I think any company that's grown over the last year and a half, I think that's impressive. And from what I have heard and, and seen of Maverick, you guys have seen significant growth. And so that's uh, that's exciting for sure. I'm sure that you guys are staying busy these days. Oh, yes. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> awesome. So, as we dive into high risk, okay? So high risk means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, as you know. Um, to yes. some ISOs, it means like they only go after, you know, uh, barely legal verticals. To others, it means they, you know, will take a furniture store. So there's, there's a pretty big gamut. So what does it mean to Maverick? What does high risk mean? And talk about just kind of uh, zooming out big picture. What's the approach been to high risk? Yeah, so... When we look at high risk, I mean, generally there's there's three different uh, characteristics that will make it quote unquote high risk, right? There's some type of regulatory compliance risk, um, there's reputational risk, and then there's financial risk. Mm-hmm. Um, we try to break it down and keep it as simple as possible, um, which is why I think we've had a lot of success uh, because the underwriting process can be a little bit cumbersome. But mm-hmm. those are kind of the three common characteristics we see. And to your point, yes, there are some more you know, I would say old school ISOs that they'll look at something that uh, just because the principal or the PG has a, a poor FICO score, it's high risk. To mm-hmm. us, you know, that doesn't really make it high risk. It's more, you know, right. a combination or one of the three um, characteristics I mentioned. Mm. And so, you know, give us that list one more time, the, the three. What are the three that you look at again one more time? Regulatory and compliance. Um, so that could be, for example, if um, the merchants operating in an industry that has age verification or their state level licensing requirements, things like that, where we have to kind of go through a whole compliance check and make sure they're meeting all the regulatory requirements. Sure. The second would be reputational risk. So, you know, for us, this is something that we can maneuver through easily, but generally our sponsor banks, you know, are a little bit more sensitive to this. So these would be industries like adult. Uh, firearms, things like that. And then the mm-hmm. third would be financial risk, which is, you know, generally the, the the easiest to overcome. That's 
just kind of charge back risk. So for example, you have a travel business mm-hmm. or a furniture operator, um, maybe they're taking payments several months in advance, which essentially is kind of extending the cont- contingent liability on our end, posing you know more financial risk, which you can mitigate through a reserve or something like that. Right. Okay. Yeah, I like this. And I like how you've broken this down. I, To me, I've always looked at reputation and, and financial. I never thought about kind of the compliance regulatory side. That's an interesting... What What are some like... Can you give me a couple of example like business types that would fall under that category? Yeah. So we see uh, card not present, um, tobacco products, alcohol products, um, you know, things like that, for example. And it's been interesting because of COVID, a lot of this was not as popular as it is now. So for example, we've seen a lot of convenience stores that historically would be low risk because it's card present, you know, low ticket amounts, things like that. Now, a lot of them have shifted into order ahead, curbside pickup, which might have a card not present Hmm. um, transaction kind of tied to it. So there's now, you know, a lot of uh, uh, kind of changes we're having to work through with these businesses that tend to not really understand this because they've never had to deal with them. All right. That's really interesting. So so in some ways, COVID has actually shifted some low risk businesses to being potentially mid or, you know, higher risk profiles. Correct. Yes. And then some others would be um, like short term lenders, you know, where mm-hmm. they might have to have a lending license in every state they work in. Right. And if there's an online application process for the consumer, how do they geofence that? So um, it's really just making sure we're complying with all the regulatory requirements, whether it's the card brands, um, the CFPB, FTC, um, mm. you know, ATF, those types of regulators. Sure. And, you know, I have one other kind of maybe off the wall question here before we dive in. I want to talk about the ISO and agent experience a little bit. But before we do that, I, what I'm kind of realizing here is probably some in our audience are maybe even a little lost already of like high mm-hmm. risk, right? They've never sold high <laughs> risk, right? You know, what is the risk? Right. So, so in other words, talk about the, both the financial side, you know, which would be the primary one of like chargebacks, like how could that actually impact Maverick payments? Like what is the actual risk? And then maybe even touching on the regulatory side, you know, give us a worst case scenario here. What is the risk that you're trying to avoid when we're talking about high risk? Got it. Yeah. So the financial risk um, would generally come from chargebacks, which ultimately the merchant would not be able to cover. So Maverick is a a full liability, full service um, provider. So anytime a merchant gets chargebacks, for example, and if they don't have sufficient funds in their bank account, those return to us and we have to cover that until we can recover it from the merchant. So in a case, you know, COVID would say a travel operator, there is a lot of instances where, you know, cardholders were making payments several months in advance, um, which kind of prolongs the already existing chargeback liability. Um, and if they don't have the funds, um, ultimately that falls on us. Um, right. You know, so, so the, the travel the, business might go out of business. They can, they can not provide the services they've already been paid for. And then Maverick correct. is not able to, to recoup the chargeback revenue. Right. Is that the idea? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And then what about, then, what about on the regulatory side? I mean, is it the same thing? Is it just like, well, if they don't comply with the regu- regulatory environment, then they would end up having to go out of business or have chargebacks or is there an, is there another risk? inherent in those deals for, for Maverick? Yeah, the, the, the risk is a little different. Um, so you can have, you know, merchants that are not complying with either card brand rules um, or regulatory rules. And when it's card brand related, um, we can get fined, you know, we can get non-compliance assessments and it kind of flows in a similar way where that gets passed on to us as a service provider. We ultimately charge it down to the merchant, but they may have closed the bank account and it'll return back to us. Right. Um, okay. And we'll see that with, you know, different business types. And then uh, on the regulatory side, um, similar, you know, the, the merchant's not complying with whatever regulatory requirements, maybe their state requires or the states they operate that, you know, requires. Uh, mm-hmm. We can get an inquiry from a regulator or our, our bank can, and that can obviously kind of escalate to an issue there as well. And then when we're talking about the ones more on the reputational side, you mentioned maybe adult and some other categories, um, firearms, I'm assuming in those cases that, that really the issue is just finding a sponsor bank that's willing to have the merchant or are there additional risks that you're looking at with those accounts? Yeah, it's generally just making sure, you know, our bank understands what our process looks like on the underwriting side with enhanced due diligence, ongoing mm-hmm. monitoring, um, and kind of overcoming those hurdles so that they understand you know, maybe these are accounts that are business types that don't really pose 
uh, regulatory risk or um, financial risk. And it, at the end of the day, it actually might be good for the portfolio or right. good businesses to have. It's just kind of getting everyone aligned and on the same page of what maybe someone's personal opinion may be on that specific business type and seeing how we could overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay, good. Well, I really appreciate that. I think zooming out helps everybody. You know, now our audience is like, okay, they all know what high risk is. Many of them of course <laughs> already do and they, they get it, but um, I just wanted to dive in a little more in detail. So now let's, let's pivot and let's dive into the details here. So when we talk about the ISO agent experience, um, you know, today with high risk, um, as you're talking to agents that are coming to Maverick, what are some of the pain points and experiences that they are having when it comes to finding that high risk account? And what is Maverick doing, you know, differently to approach this, uh, this problem and provide a good experience to the agent in the ISO? Yeah. So we try to streamline everything and simplify it. Um, my personal kind of opinion is I think over the years, a lot of ISOs that take high risk haven't really seen the need to invest um, in kind of value add technology, onboarding processes, digital applications, digital signatures, things like that. So, you know, what we kind of see is a lot of these agents we work with are used to this very long process that includes, you know, a lot of manual documentation and just mm -hmm. it, it's very overcomplicated. There's a lot of friction. Um, and when you look at, you know, kind of where we're at in the industry nowadays with Stripe and the payment facilitators, it's the complete opposite. So we've built right. a very simplified online application uh, where you could easily drag and drop documents. Uh, we have our own electronic signature tool. Um, our online application also has a dynamic document um, kind of listing mechanism that based on the transaction type, whether it's card present, card not present, the monthly volume, it'll pretty you know, much break down what documents are needed. Um, so the underwriting process is quicker. Um, so again, we just try to simplify it and really make it easy both for the agent and the merchant so that overall it's a, a quick process. Hmm. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Okay. Um, so uh, let's let's also talk about the compensation side. So another area of, I think, confusion for agents and ISOs is, you know, they, they have their current residual split, right? And then they find that, you know, firearms dealer or whatever it is, CBD shop or something. And they are like, okay, cool. I found another account and they send it in and, you know, they take it to a high risk provider and the high risk provider gives them a lower residual split on that account. And that's an industry standard practice. Um, you know, if, if those that are new to high risk, they can kind of feel like, wait a minute, I'm getting ripped off here. Um, of course, they're not. You know, can you explain a little bit of how Maverick approaches compensation when it comes to high risk uh, from a high level? And, you know, obviously, I know you can't share too much detail here, but give us a little bit of kind of just the context of how you deal with that. Correct. So because we take all the liability, generally, our agents do not participate in any liability. Um, that's where we kind of justify the lower split. Um, internally, there's a, a tremendous amount of in, uh, increased resources as well to support these businesses for underwriting risk, compliance, and a lot of third-party tools we use as well um, for website monitoring, compliance, for reputational monitoring. So, you know, for us, it, it, it really just boils down to it has to make obviously financial sense to support these both from an operational um, overhead perspective, along with assuming the risk that, you know, come with those businesses. Um, and we tier, you know, our, our agents. So as they grow with us, they get a more competitive um, split. And we have some larger kind of, um, you know, strategic partners that will share in the risk to help kind of get them also to a more lucrative uh, right. schedule A as well. So it sounds like there, there's two components here, you know, number one, and, and for those, again, that maybe aren't as familiar, high risk accounts generally are priced significantly higher. There's a lot more, you know, quote unquote margin, uh, you know, on these accounts, generally speaking, from an effective rate perspective. And what you're saying is, first of all, a bigger chunk of that profit is there to cover the inherent risk of the portfolio that has these high risk accounts. And so the residual is going to be a little bit less as a result. And then also you're saying there's higher operational costs in order to support the accounts, which also has to be taken into account when you're looking at uh, compensation of the agent of the ISO. Is that, is that about right? Exactly. Yeah. So if we look at just our underwriting and risk department, you know, a large majority of their time is spent just serving um, and supporting these higher risk merchants. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, and then, you know, when we talk about the experience of the ISOs and agents, now that you've had some time, you've really been more focused on these higher risk uh, type accounts. 
Is there some patterns that you've noticed? Are there some ISOs and agents that have been more successful that have maybe, you know, through COVID have maybe transitioned to going after more of a card not present environment? I'm just curious if there's anything that you've seen that you've seen as like kind of a pattern of success for some of these um, individuals or even small teams that have been successful there. Yeah. So, um, you know, you kind of brought up an interesting point, which was agents that, um, you know, primarily work in lower risk industries might throw an account, you know, our way that's CBD. And all of a sudden, they're kind of caught um, off guard with the lower split. So um, what we've seen is definitely some agents who try to, you know, come from the low risk world into the high risk, it can be a little challenging, because there is that learning curve of the additional documents required for underwriting. Underwriting is obviously not as quick as a low risk approval um, in the ongoing monitoring. And when we kind of compare the two, high risk really is more, you know, taken from a consulting type of approach because these are larger accounts. Um, And generally, you know, once you get them approved, your job is not done. There's still a lot of ongoing management. Um, You know, even though our team deals with a lot of that, a lot of the times the agent will get an escalation if, you know, the merchant ran a a large transaction or maybe they have some elevated chargebacks, things like that. So the agents who can kind of um, differentiate between, you know, working with low risk merchants and high risk merchants, setting the right expectations. That's where we've seen a lot of success. Um, we've definitely seen some pain points where they try to treat them the same. Um, and then in terms of COVID, you know, and just kind of the industry, you know, changes and how things have been adopted over the last year, year and a half. Um, there's definitely been a lot of good patterns where we'll see some industries that have now become kind of quote unquote moderate or high risk because maybe they're now doing a majority of bitter transactions in a card not present environment. And then the agents will proactively go work with other providers out there um, that can maybe help with, you know, order ahead um, or age verification or these other services and tools, um, whether it's also chargeback mitigation, chargeback prevention, um, to make sure that these merchants, you know, are kind of buttoned up so that, you know, obviously there's longevity behind the account. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I like it. So um, let's shift gears. I have one one other question that is kind of on a, on a related note that um, I was talking actually Maurice over there about recently uh, as well. But, um, you know, I know Visa has made some changes to their chargeback calculation, uh, maybe as a result of some of the shift to card not present. I'm not sure. But can you talk a little bit about what this change was and maybe how that's impacting some of these merchant accounts to become more of a high risk versus a, a low risk account? Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously we're, we're a full service provider and behind us, we have a sponsor bank or an acquiring bank and we're required by our banks to have a blended portfolio. And what that means is overall, the chargeback ratios have to be under a certain limit. Um, we have to have, you know, a blend of MCCs or merchant category codes with tie to the business types. So restaurants versus smoke shops, et cetera. And, um, ultimately that all rolls up you know, to the acquire, whether they have one ISO like us or they have 20. And with Visa specifically, they have a program called VAMP, which is an acquire monitoring program. And that takes into account the acquire level overall chargeback activity and fraud activity. Um, Historically, it included all merchants, card present and card not present. And for us, what we would be able to do is get very aggressive with low risk because it really helped Uh, balance the portfolio. And we had kind of this secondary value and return on it because we can get, you know, more aggressive and scale and be more sustainable with high risk. And as of October, Visa changed how VAM uh, looks at this activity to be solely based on card not present. And kind of what we've been told is because EMV has been adopted in card present businesses um, and reducing chargebacks and fraud significantly, that is now no longer part of the equation for VAMP. So for us, um, you know, it's been challenging in ways because now we have to, you know, essentially figure out strategy to get card not present business that does not have chargebacks. Um, So we've come up with, you know, kind of a new risk level called moderate risk. Um, So there's a more competitive schedule A and revenue share or card not present businesses that pose, you know, not as much risk as maybe a traditional high risk merchant. Um, and that's been really successful. So mm-hmm. with visa changes, you know, it just, it's part of the industry, especially right. in the high risk world, things change and you have to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. I think we'll, 
probably be even hearing more about that is, you know, as that becomes, uh, you know, the, the accepted way and oh, yeah. everybody's trying to adjust. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure it'll be interesting. Uh, so, uh, well, this has been great information. I think um, I think high risk is one of those things that a lot of our listeners, um, I think, would be in kind of one of two camps. It's like either they love high risk, they they that's what they focus on, and I think for them, they may like some of the things you said about the streamlining. Then I think there's others who kind of have decided high risk is not worth their time um, because every time they try to do it, it ends up being a big mess. For some of them, they should stay away from it because they're not willing to engage. They're not willing to really, like you mentioned, kind of consult and service the account and get it approved and then work with it after. But for others, they just haven't find, found the right solution. So for those that do want to learn more about you and about uh, Maverick, where would you send them to get more information about your programs? Because I know obviously you do a lot more than just high risk as well. Correct. Yeah, we do everything um, from A to Z. And the best way to contact us is, you know, obviously we have our website, maverickpayments.com, our email that can be used is uh, sales at maverickhq.com, HQ as in headquarters. Um, and for us, you know, we love talking with new partners. We generally do a quick 10, 15 minute um, intro call with a demo of our dashboard, which can also be fully white labeled. Uh, you could have your sub agents in there, manage portfolio, residual. The whole onboarding process is digital. Like I said, we have our own electronic signature tool. Uh, we also have our, our own payment gateway. We do ACH processing in-house as well. And then we have an API um, that can support everything visually from the dashboard uh, for integrated partners as well. Great. Awesome. Uh, well, Ben, I just want to say thank you so much for taking time to jump on and educate the audience. Um, this is a topic that we don't talk about as often as we probably should in the podcast. Um, so I really appreciate you guys coming on and I'm excited to hear how it goes at Maverick as you really implement uh, this continued focus on high risk. I think it's going to be a, a big game changer for you guys. Wonderful. Well, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Um, and uh, let's stay in touch because yes, I think high risk um, is generally something that should be talked about a lot more in the industry. Yeah. Okay, so folks, uh, this week our, our episode is brought to you by NMI, and you can visit them at nmi.com. James, you know, something came across my desk this week that really kind of jumped out at me because it involved an NMI and also because of what it was. Uh, Fast Company, we've all heard of Fast yep, Company. Yep. Um, they, they just launched this year their inaugural Big Things in Tech. Award. Okay, okay. And NMI was one of uh, 60 some odd companies that were honored that uh, re you know were, were received mentions in the you know best of tech mm. uh b biggest things in tech and and they were um they were honored for what they call their tap to mobile software and this is really cool james we haven't talked about this much yeah. in the past i've talked about it a few times in my insider report right but you know the whole idea about both visa and mastercard to come out with these tap to mobile they call them virtually the same thing um right think it's one's tap on phone and the other's tap to phone or something like that. Right, sure. Uh, NMI has come up with this much easier tap to mobile uh, moniker. And, you know, it's a great, it's almost, it's a real game changer, particularly for small merchants and micro merchants, um, you know, who, who typically don't have access to some of the real high end um, POS solutions. And basically it converts any kind of smartphone um, into a feature-rich terminal that um, you can use for contactless payments. Mm. And with contact is becoming so popular these yeah. days. I mean, it is it is becoming the way to pay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was really struck when I saw that they had come out with this technology a few months ago. And uh, now that they're being honored, I think it sort of shows that this is yeah. a hot technology. Yeah. People should be offering it. And, you know, NMI has a has a great solution uh, that goes along with everything else they offer, you know, with right. processor agnostic gateway. Yep. I love it. So for more information on that, head over to ccsalespro.com slash NMI, fill out the form there and NMI will reach out to you so that you can learn more about their solutions and definitely ask them about their tap to mobile uh, to learn more about how you can help these kind of more micro merchants um, leverage uh, their phone as the contactless device. And now... Here is Questions from the Field with James Shepard. So, Patty, uh, I made a post on um, LinkedIn and Facebook recently, just uh, just a few days ago, actually, just talking about um, in sales. I think the quote that I made was, um, I saw sales, that. salespeople yeah. acknowledge the negative, but right. they emphasize and focus on the positive. And 
I just wanted to dive into that a little bit more because I think it's so important. And I, I actually want to go way, way, way back about uh, 18 years ago when I was working at a pet store um, as a uh, senior in high school. Uh, I was managing a little pet store and then, you know, everything. And so, um, you know, that was my first experience with sales. Of course, retail sales, people come in. Um, but I really loved it. I've always loved sales. And I took it as a personal challenge to be like, I want to be the person in the pet store that was selling the most revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and I really zeroed in on, at that time on fish tanks. And so my first business, I don't think any of our listeners would know this, but my very first business actually was uh, servicing, lar installing and servicing large saltwater reef aquariums. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and this is the day I, so I graduated high school on a Friday. Um, I quit my job that day. And um, on Saturday, uh, I went down to the, or no, Monday morning, I went down to the, um, uh, uh, what they call it, the office there. Anyway, the, the treasurer, there's the like business. a little clerk yeah. and I had to register. And so I registered my business on Monday and I was an entrepreneur. It's like, I'm done with high school. Now I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I ended up going back into employment about a year later when I realized I had no idea what I was doing in business. I needed <laughs> a little bit more seasoning. I needed some learning. Yes. yes. Um, but uh, during that year, I had this fishing, you know, business. And anyway, all that's a long, long intro there to say, one of the lessons that I learned in that business was, when I was trying to sell something to someone, you know, my initial approach was, you know, all positive, you know, um, this is, a, you know, you're going to love this fish tank. It's going to look beautiful in your home. You should buy this. You should buy this. It's going to be fantastic. Everything's going to be great. You're going to just be relaxed when you look at it. And I realized that a lot of people were hesitant to move forward. And I thought, well, I'm giving them a great presentation. And what I started to realize was in order for me to build trust with them, I had to acknowledge the negative. Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the negative could be many different things. You know, maybe sure. they're looking at you know, different filtration systems. One is more expensive than the other. Right. And I would say, you know, um, you could go with this more expensive one. But honestly, I don't think you need that. Um, I think this lower cost one would be would be fine. Here are the trade offs. And I would kind of explain it. So it seems like a minor thing, but they would be like, OK, in their mind, they realize this is a person who's not just blowing smoke. Right. Um, this is someone who is giving me real advice. Um, mm -hmm. It's an expert and they're telling me about the positives and the negatives. You know, um, I would talk about, you know, they're going to buy a certain kind of fish. And I'd say, you know, th these fish, the mortality rate is pretty high. Actually, when you transfer them, um, they're beautiful, though. So if you want them, great. But, you know, they you, they may not make it. So just be aware of that. And so little things like that. And so, you know, I would try to go for that larger deal, of course, and make this big sure. five, six thousand dollar sale on this huge aquarium. But the way I would get there is by, you know, emphasize by, you know, emphasizing the positive, but by acknowledging and being just really transparent and honest about the negative. So mm -hmm. translating that to credit card processing, I would really encourage our listeners to think about the deal from the merchant's perspective. They are always going to be wondering what's the catch, right. you know? If they don't have an answer to that question, then they're not going to move forward. And this especially goes for cash discounting and surcharging, where it's a too good to be true situation. You know, mm -hmm. um, hey, I'm going to wipe out all your processing fees. It's going to be just like it is now. Everybody's going to love it. It's going to be fantastic. And you're going to save a $20,000 a year. Right, right. Well, the merchant is going to say, okay. and But in their mind, they're thinking, well, what's the catch? And, and when they say, well, let me think about it. Tell you, leave me some information. A lot of time, what they're saying is, I don't believe you. Right. Or there's something you're not telling me. I don't, I don't understand. There's a catch here. So instead tell them and say, you know, before you sign up for this, I want to make sure you're the right fit. So let me talk to you about some of how this process goes, right? So we set it up. What we found is about 1% of the people who, you know, the transactions that come through your business um, are going to make a comment about this, right? They're not necessarily all going to be upset about it, but they're going to say, Hey, what is this? Right. 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 We're going to need to train your employees. Right. And so you're going to save $20,000 a year is going to drop to the bottom line. But in exchange, I do want to make it you know, clear to you that this is a new process. We are going to have to do some training with your employees. We're going to have to have some new materials here to you know, provide to them. We're going to be putting the signage up. Um, and so there are a few things there that are trade-offs. Do you have any questions about any of that before we move forward with this? Right. So, right. you know, acknowledging that. And then when they come back in and, you know, um, talk about it. Well, then you transition. Um, I'll give you one other example real quick and I'll be done. Um, you know, I was recently talking, uh, I did a, um, a live training event for a company that's just starting to sell cash discounting. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that one of the agents said was, well, wait a minute, you know, we're currently selling at, you know, two and a half percent, 2.7%, right? 
I can't sell this at 4%. The merchant's going to say like, why is it 4%, right? And I told, you know, this individual, I said, you know, this is why you're in sales because your job is to acknowledge the negative, justify right. it, but then you have to be able to pivot and emphasize the positive, right? So I said, you know, in this case, I like to use an, a, a, you know, an example story and I'll say, you know, when they ask about that, why 4%, I said, let me ask you a question. Have you ever paid your utility bill or your phone bill over the phone with a card? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Do you remember how there's that convenience fee or they'll call it a processing fee or whatever? And, oh yeah. Do you remember how much it was? No. Do you remember that it was a lot? Yeah. I remember that it was a lot. Yeah. That, that's because this is a totally different kind of processing. Like, you know, not only are there extra costs associated with compliance and managing the risk of all of this, making sure everything is set up correctly. Um, but, you know, also we're, you know, you're collecting a small amount of money from a lot of people instead of one amount you know, from one company. So there's some various costs. I don't want to dive into all the details, but you're right. It is absolutely, it, there is a higher cost. I'm not trying to avoid that at all. But I think the key here, the main thing we want to talk about is it's justified because you're not paying it. This is something right. the customer is paying. Obviously right. they don't care if it's 3% or three and a half or four that to them, that doesn't matter at all. And we have to make sure we're covering our costs. So right. are there any other questions that you have about the terminal, the equipment that we're going to provide? Cause I want to make sure we're giving you the right equipment to help you move forward with your business. Right. We're, we're right. pivoting and we're talking about something positive. Um, and so you acknowledge it, you deal with it, but you, then you move right back over and keep emphasizing and focusing on the positive and, and really doing that, you know, that is how you actually get deals done and closed. Yeah, that's really great advice, James. Thanks. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. So, James, we have a clash of titans of sorts, I would say, uh, going on in the market right now, um, with Amazon announcing that it will no longer accept Visa cards that are issued in the United Kingdom beginning right. in January. Of course, they pushed it to January, just not to mess up the holiday season, I guess. All right, um, right, right. But in an e email to their UK customers, the e-commerce giant said the move only applies to Visa credit cards, not debit cards. Okay. And there's about an estimated, I, I looked up this up, there's about 20 million Visa branded credit cards in the UK, issued in the UK. Mm. Now this, I, I reached out to Amazon and they said, quote, the cost of accepting card payments continues to be an obstacle for businesses striving to provide the best prices for customers. These costs should be going down over time with technological advancements, but instead they continue to stay high or even rise. Mm, I agree. Now, of course, this <laughs> isn't the first word out of Amazon and Visa pricing, sure. and it, it's not going to be the light last, I suspect. Um, earlier this year, the company began surcharging Visa credit card transactions in Singapore and Australia, also citing high costs. Yep. Now, um, Visa's chief financial officer, Vasin Prabhu, Prabhu, I believe is how you pronounce it, told Reuters during an interview earlier this week that he expected a resolution. He said, quote, we've resolved these things in the past and I believe we'll resolve them in the future. Right. Yeah. Well, I but, think that's why they, I think that's why they waited till January because oh, I yeah. don't, I don't think Amazon has any intention of actually not accepting them. I think they just needed to get that announcement out there to have the leverage to renegotiate. Oh, I, I agree, you know, yeah. uh, and, and but, you know, several analysts that I read some reports from said, you know, it's going to it could be it is a warning to Visa and MasterCard right. because merchants with, you know, have access to a growing array of new payment methods. Right. And they're starting to gain the upper hand on this interchange battle. You know, yeah. um, there's a guy named Chris Dinga with a UK um, consulting firm called Global Data. He said that he that if if. Amazon goes through with this, it would be a significant loss of revenue for Visa in the UK without too much damage to Amazon's bottom line, since Amazon is such a dominant player with millions of loyal customers. Yeah. And, you know, while credit cards remain a dominant method of online nine cash payments, there is growing co competition from alternatives like buy now, pay later. Right. Um, a report well, and, there, and even, issued, even alternatives like Amazon's own payment method. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, or these uh, account to account things, you know, right. um, Venmo and whatnot. Yeah. So and Venmo. Sure. And, you know, WorldPay issued a report earlier this year. I think it was back in the summer where, where they reported that the share of online spending done with credit cards actually fell 7 percent last year, mm. while buy now pay later transactions soared 78 percent. 
Right. And of course, in August, uh, Amazon partnered with the buy now, pay later provider firm. Right. Um, Dinga wrote, uh, BNPL is gradually being adopted by retailers as they see higher conversion and growth opportunity by providing it to their customers. High interchange fees could accelerate this adoption. Yeah. Now, I just wanted to kind of put all this in context. Uh, part of the clash between Visa and Amazon is tied to the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Right. Because the EU capped interchange, I believe it's like 0.2% for debit, 0.3% for credit. Mm -hmm. credit. But those caps, of course, no longer apply uh, in, the, in the UK. And mm -hmm. since the UK withdrew from um, the EU, <clears throat> both Visa and MasterCard have raised interchange on UK cards. Right. Um, and Visa's online cross-border transactions between the UK and U EU for credit cards, for example, is now 1.5. And debit cards are 1.15. So, right. of course, the big question that, you know, came to mind for me originally was, well, why didn't MasterCard go after, uh, Amazon go after MasterCard? Of course, there's a simple answer there, and that is that Amazon offers a co-branded MasterCard product in the UK. <laughs> so, right, right. You know, not going to cut off your nose to spite your face, as my mother would say. Oh, right. They, um, have, they have to uh, uh, pick their enemy there. So. Right, right. But, you know, this clash does come amid uh, increased scrutiny of interchange, um, in the, both in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, in November, earlier this month, the Merchants Payments Coalition called for a Federal Trade Commission investigation, arguing that interchange fees are contributing to increased gas prices. Hmm. Um, the National Association of Convenience Stores, which is a member of the Merchant Payments Coalition, said in a statement that interchange payments by gas stations are up nearly 20% this year. And with the ongoing spike in gas prices, he, uh, they expect uh, that, that gas stations are on track to pay more than $12.5 in interchange in 2021. Wow. Now, remember, the FTC is already investigating Visa and MasterCard policies that merchants complain hamper the routing of card not present debit card payments you know, through the less expensive regional networks like NICE and Shazam. Mm. Also, in September, the UK's payment systems regulator said it was looking into interchange pricing. The agency said in a statement that, quote, there are real questions about how well the card market is working, close quote, and also that uh, it would, quote, look into how well this market is working, including the issue of increasing card fees if necessary, we will intervene to address any issues we identify. I mean, I'll be so, shocked if they don't, if the UK doesn't regulate interchange. It's not that they were, they, it's not that they're against that at all. They, no, it's just no, that the it EU just, had the regulation for them and they didn't worry about it. They didn't have to worry about it. It was sort of like one, I think it was like, I was talking about this with a friend this morning. It's like, it's one of those least considered uh, ramifications. Nobody thought about things like credit card Right. Interchange right. when they were debating the Brexit. Brexit, you know, I mean, yeah. that wasn't even I'm sure that right. didn't even enter the conversation. Yeah. But I don't I wouldn't be surprised to see the um, UK regulators um, do something about this. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's interesting. You know, Amazon, I think, has such an interesting position to play in all this, too, because on, on the one side, you know, they are benefiting from interchange fees mm -hmm. with their co-branded um, credit card. Right. Oh, um, yeah. You know, so it's 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 interesting to see how it's going to play out. I think long term, I think they believe they're not going to need MasterCard either. Right. Um, and they'll have their own card and they'll have their own you know system set up. So they don't quite. It's interesting to think that there's anything that Amazon wouldn't have the scale to do yet. Right. Um, but I think having their own credit card processing network takes a little bit more than one yeah. it's a little bit outside of their wheelhouse it is so yeah. i think it'll be interesting to see how they play it um and even you know you're putting it into context they're upset about 1.5 percent on yeah right some of these <laughs> cards in the right. uk right and in the they u.s here, market three like percent <laughs> right yeah so I in know. the u.s market we have all these cards that are you know two percent plus right and that's that's not even like this extra fee that's not like a downgrade that's like just a normal rewards card so um yeah so i think it'll be very yeah. interesting to see how that plays out yeah I'm, I'm really i'm really interested in seeing how i mean i you know it was interesting i was in a meeting with my colleagues at the green sheet and everybody's like oh do you see what you know 
Visa did, I mean, excuse me, what Amazon did to Visa, and I'm like, you know, we have we have history for this. There was the whole Kroger thing a few years ago, yeah. remember? Mm -hmm. And then there was also the Walmart in Canada. Right, right. Uh, and, and the other thing, too, is that a lot of the, you know, as our audience knows, most of these big retailers directly negotiate with Visa and MasterCard. Mm -hmm. So their rates are below the standard I know. And, that, anyway. and that's one, one of that's one of the things that actually bothers me the most, you know, mm -hmm. to, to me, like, you know, I, I'm not a, in favor of government regulation as a general rule in business uh, like this. But in this situation, what I would love to see is just a regulation that says Visa and MasterCard have to set interchange. And whatever they set it at, that is what everyone Everybody has to pay. Pays. Yeah, I agree. If, if they would do that, then what would happen is small business owners would benefit from the pressure and the leverage that Walmart and Amazon have mm -hmm. to lower these costs. You know, to me, there, there's the the way that the way that the networks are structured. There's just no reason why Visa should be collecting a higher rate from a small business than a large business. There's no extra no. risk for them. There's no extra work for them at all. They, they nope. deal with the acquiring banks and the, and the acquiring bank is the one that deals with the merchant. And so the way it's all structured, it's kind of like, what's the point of, of them yeah. having these different rates other than just they have their, it's a free market and they're negotiating for volume. But right. to me, it just seems inherently unfair. And the small business owners, are the ones that get, but, but small business owners are fighting back in their own way with cash discounting and surcharging. So and surcharging and buy now, pay later. Yep. Yep. You exactly. Know? So the free market's doing what it does. And I think it'll just play itself out over a long period of time, but I think uh, yeah. a little bit of very targeted regulation in this case, I think would be nice. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's it's equitable. It's all about equity, you know? I mean, yeah. like you say, I mean, yeah, so Walmart has a lot more volume, but you take the, you know, what, uh, 20 plus million very small businesses in the country. Right. Well, you look at, yeah. you look at a, you look at a Pfizer or an FIS and, and the way that they, I mean, they, they do as much volume, they do more volume than Walmart. Right. And so, right. you know, yeah. so to me, it just seems like there should be an aggregate there that would be able to yeah. get something done. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. So, yep. Good stuff. Thanks, Patty. Uh-huh. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of Greensheet.com and CCSalesPro.com, and we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.